Achaemenid Empire. A high plateau spreads off towards India east of the Zagros Mountains. While Egypt was fighting the Hyksos, a wave of pastoral tribes from north of the Caspian Sea migrated south into this area, and into India. A second wave had spanned the whole region between the Zagros and the Hindu Kush by the time the Assyrians founded their new empire. Some tribes chose to settle, while others chose to remain semi-nomadic. These were the people of Iran. The Iranian tribes, like other nomadic peoples without police and courts, had a code of honor, and their religious beliefs differed from those of agricultural people. Whereas Egyptian Mesopotamian farmers had turned nature gods into city guards, Iranians had begun to condense them into a few universal principles. Zoroaster, who lived approximately 1000 BCE, was the catalyst for this change. The creator, Ahura Mazda, the bringer of Asha, light, order, and truth, the law or logic by which the world was constructed, was his sole god. Even individuals who were not Zoroastrians were molded by a society that emphasized simple ethical principles like honesty. In certain places, a single tribe might be able to unite a number of other tribes under its control. One such people was the Medes. They established a capital at Ekbatna, meeting place, in the eastern Zagros, from whence they spread their influence. Syaxares, king of the Medes, and the Chaldeans besieged Nineveh in 612 BCE, following which he marched towards the northwest. A solar eclipse terrified both sides into making peace in 585 BCE, while the Medes were battling the Lydians on the Halys River. Syaxares died soon after, leaving his son Astyages, 585 to 550 BCE, with a type of empire. Persia, which located southeast of Ekbatna and beyond Elam, was one of the territories whose tribes paid tribute to the Medes. Persia had about 10 or 15 tribes, one of which being the Pasargadi. The Pasargadi's leader was always an Achaemenid, and a new leader was elected in 559 BCE, Cyrus II, the Great. On his mother's side, Cyrus was the grandson of Astyages, but that didn't stop him from desiring to throw off the Median yoke. He had created a federation of Persian tribes and started a series of uprisings by 552 BCE. In 550 BCE, when the inevitable battle with his grandpa arrived, the Medes revolted and supported Cyrus in marching on Ekbatna. Cyrus was crowned Shah, King, of Persia, and he established a city on the site of his triumph which he named Pasargadi after his clan. However, conquering the Medes had left Cyrus with a hazy, vast kingdom including numerous diverse peoples. He had to deal with a wide range of cultural influences, mistrust, and downright hatred. The Medes had made deals with Lydia and Chaldean Babylon, and neither felt threatened by a Persian conquest. Because Cyrus disobeyed the rules, Lydia was victorious. King Croesus, c. 560, c. 546 BCE, returned to Sardis after an inconclusive war near the Halys River one fall, intending to fight again in the spring, as was customary. Cyrus, on the other hand, pursued him home and took Sardis, Lydia's capital and the wealthiest of the Ionian cities. Lydia had produced the first coins a century before, establishing Ionia as a trade center Cyrus was now in charge of everything. 
In the case of Croesus, it appears that Cyrus may have saved his life, which is unprecedented. Cyrus had a reputation for sparing captured kings in order to seek their counsel on how to effectively administer their territories. It's difficult to say how much of this reputation was deserved, but no one would have desired it before Cyrus, it would have been seen as a sign of weakness. Cooperation, on the other hand, was seen as a strength by Cyrus, especially when it came to capturing the major prize, Babylon. Rather of seeking to conquer the world's largest metropolis by force, Cyrus waged a propaganda campaign to capitalize on Nabonidus' disfavor. The message was that with Cyrus, Babylon's traditions will be protected. As he entered the city, the gates were opened and palm fronds were placed in front of him. Cyrus restored seized symbols to their temples across Babylon after performing the religious rites Nabonidus had ignored. Cyrus was able to claim legal reign in Babylon as a result of these actions, which were sanctioned by the Babylonian gods. He went on to describe how this would fit into his empire, his would be an empire built on a type of contract between himself and the different peoples entrusted to his care. They'd pay their payment, and he'd make sure that everyone was free to worship their own gods and follow their own traditions. Exiled Jews were permitted to return home and were given funds to help build a new temple in Jerusalem. This gained Cyrus a laudatory mention in the Old Testament, as well as a helpful buffer state against Egypt. Cyrus' multiculturalism made a long-term imperial peace a genuine option for the first time, and it determined how succeeding emperors tried to establish stable control. Cyrus knew that this was the only way he could keep his victories, but his vision was one that only someone from outside the River Valley civilizations, with their deep devotion to local gods, could have envisioned. Cambyses II, 529-522 BCE, Cyrus's son and successor added Egypt to the Persian Empire, but at home, a revolution erupted, headed, it appears, by a Median priest acting as Cambyses's brother, whom Cambyses had secretly slain. Cambyses rushed back but died en route, leaving one of his generals, a distant relative, to take over. Darius was his name. Darius I, the Great, slew the pretender to the throne, but riots erupted across the empire, and he was forced to re-establish Cyrus' conquests. Darius recovered the empire and extended it into the Indus Valley, a prize worth many times more in tribute than Babylon, with the help of the army and the aristocratic clans of Persia who had become wealthy under imperial rule. Darius recognized that for the empire to function, it needed to be well organized. He divided it into 20 satrapies, or provinces, each of which paid Persia a certain amount of tribute. Each satrapy was led by a centrally selected satrap, or governor, who was frequently Darius' relative. To prevent the satrap from establishing a stronghold, Darius created a separate military commander who was exclusively responsible to him. The king's ears, or imperial spies, kept tabs on both and reported back to Darius via the mail service. The empire was connected by a network of routes along which messengers might change horses at stations spaced a day's journey apart. Darius borrowed much of this framework from the Assyrians and just scaled it up, but his use of tribute was novel. Previously, tribute had been viewed as a form of protection money paid to stay out of trouble, but Darius viewed it as a tax. He spent it on a fleet and enormous public spending projects, 
including irrigation projects, mineral exploration, highways, and a canal connecting the Nile and the Red Sea. He also developed a single currency, making it much simpler to labor away from home. Darius now gathered teams of craftsmen from around the empire to construct an imperial capital at Persepolis under the supervision of Persian architects. He could store his gold and silver in a massive vault, which quickly proved too small, and display his empire's multi-ethnic breadth. Persepolis became a showcase for the creative styles of nearly every civilization inside the empire, all housed in a Persian-style frame. It was a graphic representation of Cyrus' empire. Darius, on the other hand, never acknowledged Cyrus. He appeared to have a chip on his shoulder over not being a member of Cyrus' Achaemenid lineage. As his successes surpassed Cyrus, he began to conduct himself in a more lofty way, abandoning the title Shah in favor of the grander Shahanshah, King of Kings. This, like Persepolis, stemmed directly from Cyrus' vision. When Cyrus invaded Babylon, he pretended to be the city's king, but his vision of empire needed a ruler who stood above all rulers tied to the interests of any single town. It necessitated the presence of a king of kings, 